in the South Pacific is a little known island, one so remote that the islanders are entirely self-sufficient. It's called Anuta, and after months of preparation, we set sail from the main cluster of the Solomon Islands towards this elusive destination. It's one of the smallest inhabited islands on Earth, just half a mile in diameter. It's tiny, but with a population of 300, Anuta has one of the highest population densities on the planet, about the same as Bangladesh. Anutans have no choice but to live in harmony with nature. They've developed ways of exploiting the natural resources in their environment that can be an inspiration to all of us. This volcanic island is part of the Solomon Island Archipelago, yet is so geographically remote that travel to any of the other islands is difficult. A boat may stop in as infrequently as few times a year, but the schedule varies, so islanders cannot rely on it to bring in supplies. From Honiara, the capital of the Solomon Islands, it's a five or six day sail in good conditions, which gives us time to finalize our preparations. Anthropologist Richard Feinberg is traveling with us. Dr. Feinberg is the world's expert on this island people. He knows them well and has learned their language. I first went to Anuta in 1972 to uh, collect data for a, a doctoral dissertation at the University of Chicago. I lived there for about a year. I was looking for a relatively unacculturated place, a place where people's way of life, their way of thinking, their way of relating to one another is very different from anything that we would experience in the United States, Canada, Europe. Giving gifts to the chiefs and the clans is customary. Our presents include fish hooks, fishing line, knives, and school supplies. Only three groups have ever been allowed to film on the island, and we are fully aware of the heavy responsibility we bear. It's reassuring to have Dr. Feinberg with us. His knowledge and invaluable advice will guide the crew in preparing for this historic encounter. Um, when we get to Anuta, chances are there will be one or more canoes coming out to the ship. It may also be that there are a number of people who swim out to the ship. And um, we will probably have some sort of formal greeting ceremony with the two chiefs. Um, they will be seated on a ceremonial mat, and we will be asked to crawl on our hands and knees up to where the two chiefs are sitting. We then press our nose to the knee of the senior chief, one at a time. The chief will probably take his hand then and put it underneath your chin and lift your face so that it's even with his, and then you press your nose to the chief's nose. Uh, the chief will lift your head out of a sense of noblesse oblige. Well, you're almost there. Yeah. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. On the morning of our sixth day at sea, there she was, magnificent, like a mirage floating above an endless ocean, Anuta. There's a canoe approaching. Is Rick awake? Yes. Okay. So should I go down here? Sure. When I saw the canoe come out, it just felt like a very familiar scene, something that I've seen dozens of times in different contexts. My first question was, who is in the canoe, and is it somebody I know? The last time I had seen Joseph was probably in 2000. So I didn't immediately recognize him, but I thought he might be the one coming out because his job, in part, is to greet people who come to the island. Hey, hey, hey welcome on board. Welcome on board. Can we move Yeah. <laughs> I yelled down his Newton name, and he yelled back up at me, yes, and climbed aboard, and we hugged for about five minutes. <laughs> Ah. We're 
rowed ashore in one of their traditional canoes. Some of the villagers give us their traditional welcome. The people who are not part of the Western world, who are living in the present time, are not living fossils. They're not representatives of what people were like centuries ago, and we're not stepping back in time. They're very much part of today's world, but they're a different part from what most people with access to televisions have the opportunity to observe. They have children who go to school. They do recognize the value of money. They do recognize the value of modern medicine. Um, they're concerned with travel and adventure and many of the same kinds of things that um, people in our part of the world are concerned about. Joseph told me that there are probably 300 people. The population is a serious issue here. Yeah. Um, when I was first on Anuta, there were only about 150 people living on the island. So in two generations, the population has doubled. Which is a lot for you know, a small island like this That's with right. limited yes. resources. And even in 2000, when I was here, People were not complaining about the resources, but it was just getting crowded to the point where people were a bit concerned about their privacy, which I found a little odd because um, privacy is much less of an issue in a place like this than it is in Canada or the US. But uh, even people here were thinking that uh, the place was getting too crowded. I am delighted to be here. I have only been here once in the past decade. It's a, uh, a bit of a shock to come here and realize that I don't know most of these people because the children were born after the last time I was here. And people's names change periodically. When they get married, they change their name. So it takes me a few minutes to figure out just who a person is. With some more. Hey! Father John. Um, I knew him first as a child. Um, I was very touched at seeing the way that he's matured into a thoughtful, responsible leader of the community. <laughs> yeah? We approached the chiefs with some trepidation. Back in 1972, when Dr. Feinberg first visited the island, the senior chief took him under his wing. Not only did he teach him all about the island's unique culture, but he also made him his brother. My first feeling was that uh, my brother had aged a great deal since the last time I saw him. But he's just as sharp and thoughtful, just as much of a forceful presence as ever. Um, I think that the bond between the two of us on a purely personal level has uh, just continued to grow. <laughs> My Canada. My Canada. The Matotarana the maple leaf. When Christmas? If you are the yeah. oldest son of the current chief, you have a pretty good chance of becoming the next chief. If you're in a um, different line, if you can't trace your ancestry or your parentage directly to a chief, then um, you are not going to be a chief. In terms of the social structure, there is really a surprising amount that has remained 
almost completely intact. They have a lot of social support. The idea of somebody being alone and neglected is almost unthinkable on Anuta, whereas it's all too common in our part of the world. So in that sense, perhaps, yes, Anutans may be happier than we are. Joseph, an Anutan who has lived in the city and speaks English, will be our guide throughout our stay. Members of the crew will be able to get to know the island and the warmth of the islanders. Okay, okay, we're going to the welcome banquet. The whole crew is invited onto the island. There will be traditional singing, there'll be ceremonial speeches, and then a banquet they've prepared for us. We'll obviously follow Joseph's instructions on what to do, but uh, you'll see it's a very nice village very well organized. Try to really make the most of the occasion because it's a privilege for all of us to experience something like this. Anutans share a common value based on cooperation, sharing, and compassion for others. This philosophy called Arupa is a basic principle for Anutans. Here, traditions still play an important role and they are handed down from generation to generation. I was skeptical. Is this a real tradition? Or are we just being made fools of by a bunch of people deliberately faking it? It quickly became apparent that that wasn't the case. Happiness is a major value for Newtons. If you ask them why they do things in a particular way, why they perform certain customs, um, there are two stock answers that they give. One is because it's the ancient custom of our island. The other is to make us happy. It was a wonderful surprise. We all had a great time. We never expected such a warm welcome. I loved it. Anuta was terrific. They really made us feel welcome, and they were really considerate, really nice. I don't think there's anything phony about it at all. I think it's a good example to follow. Following an age-old tradition, the 300 islanders came to greet us, one by one. This close contact greeting, called piquita, is a kind of nose kiss that allows you to penetrate the other person's bubble. Though unable to communicate with words, we felt a human warmth that went straight to our hearts. Indescribable. <clears throat> it's very moving. An energy from your people that is very hard to describe with words. No yeah. problem. It's just was a very intense feeling. No, and we are not looking for difference, but we are looking for unity. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> unity. Unity. <laughs> unity. <laughs> yeah. Only the uh, baby face. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> it's hard to put into words because it's so moving. Intensely emotional. I'm still caught up in it. I think the best word... When we approached, as soon as they started to sing, there was... There was really... Um, it was as if all barriers fell away, and there was just this experience. And I said to myself, just let it go and take it all in. And I started to cry. 
Ça fait je sais pas combien de temps qu'on dit qu'on est privilégié. I don't know how many times we've heard that it's a privilege to be here. But I truly feel privileged. Vraiment. Truly. It's true, I like this way of greeting. You fully get who the person is. You're in contact with both the physical being and the psychic entity. But at the same time, they're very respectful. Nice to see you. <laughs> The arrival of the church occurred not too long after a um, pretty devastating famine. And um, when something like that happens, people start to question the efficacy of the old religion. The church preaches love and support, uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. And, um, the Newtons were able to look at their own traditional value of Arupa, and they could say, in essence, we were Christians before the church appeared. The chief invited us to his leaf house and agreed to speak of the past, about the time not so long ago when life here was very different. Yes, they certainly did. In the old days, when strangers came to the island, we would kill them. A good thing for us. Yes. <laughs> the community here has a great uh, relationship with nature. You know, you can find your food, your house, everything come from nature. Did you see any changes over time? Um, is there less fish, less bird? Is it um, much harder than before? It seems to me that there are more fish than there used to be. But on the other hand, there are fewer birds than before. There have been famines in the past, but things are better now. I remember one famine when people had to eat dirt to survive, but now that the church has come here, there are fewer famines. Our current God protects us better than the old one did. It's a very small island, and uh, there's more and more people. Um, is he anxious about that? The population of the island is increasing, but we don't worry about it. We have to accept and love all those who wish to come here. What is the importance of nature for human? The way I look at it, the purpose of nature is to sustain life. Nature provides all our daily necessities. But it also gives us whatever we need to defend ourselves against her rages. Well, thanks him very much, and um, I hope that you will have a long, long life. <laughs> he already has. <laughs> <laughs> we spent time, lots of time, with islanders who quickly became friends. They asked us to tell them who we were, what we're doing. And they did the same. In a world where barriers between individuals seem non-existent, 
perhaps because of Europa, the life principle based on respect and compassion. On Anuta, hunting means only one thing. Catching birds is an ancient practice, which takes place at night at the top of a cliff, where terns and other seabirds nest. to attract them here, so they'll fly right over our heads. They have long poles with nets at the end. They try to catch them and fly. I think they're quite conscious of their relationship with the environment. There isn't any point in continuing to catch fish or hunt birds if they have as much as they can use. But they also know that the supply is limited, and if they overfish or if they overhunt, that um, they can damage the supply in the long run, and it'll be a, a problem. Fishing is the main activity on Anuta, and their survival depends on it. Anutans are remarkable swimmers, and their thorough knowledge of the coral reefs that encircle the island is impressive. Anuta is very remote, probably about as remote as any place you can find on Earth, and they are pretty much self-sufficient. In some ways, that self-sufficiency is a little bit of an illusion because um, they catch fish with metal fish hooks and monofilament fishing line. They use waterproof flashlights to hunt fish and collect shellfish at night. Uh, when they go to work in the garden, they use metal knives and axes. So it's not completely cut off in that sense. Food is incredibly important to the Anutans. Food is connected with the idea of life. We think of somebody dying when the person stops breathing, when the heart stops beating. Um, the Anutans, at least traditionally, regarded the point of death as coming when the person could no longer eat. Anutans use a variety of fishing techniques, depending on fluctuations in temperature, wave strength, and tides. These techniques were developed to ensure a steady food supply, no matter what the weather and environmental conditions. Here, they eat anything, as long as they limit the catch to the needs of the community. If the population grows too fast, the results could very well be disastrous. There has to be some way of controlling the resident population. Somehow, the population has to be kept in balance with what the environment has to provide. Farming is vital for Anutans. At the top of the island, each extended family has a garden that provides the food needed to feed its members. They mainly grow manioc, taro, and some fruits such as banana and papaya. Crop rotation keeps the soil in good condition. To ward against famine and natural disaster, Anutans store a paste made of manioc or taro, which ferments in the ground. 
called ma. This food can stay buried for several years before being eaten. Anutans know the value of money, but they don't use it in their daily lives. However, they have set up a student association so that young people can go to school off-island. I live here and then I go over to Honiara. I've been to... I go to school in the vocational school in Aftara. It's a technical school. I took up a course as a mechanic and then, yeah, I finished and then I work in Honiara. It's about nine years. I came back because uh, I went to look after my parents and then, yeah, because they're getting old, so I think it's a big responsibility for me because I'm their kid and their kid, so when I become a man, I have to look after them as they look after me when I was a kid. Life here is very different compared to town, I mean to Onyara. Onyara is uh, so much noisy, sometimes you don't know what will happen to you. Yeah, you don't know, I mean, there are lots of people and you don't know what they're in there. Yeah, man, if they, whether you are safe, you're really safe or not. But here, you feel safe because um, you know everybody. Here, you understand all the people. Eh? You receive everything free. I mean, you don't have to pay for your food. You just work for it. And you go anywhere you like without paying your transport and something like that. The island supply of large trees is limited. When a tree is felled to make a canoe, it becomes a full member of the extended family. So, Joseph, that was his canoe, right? Yes, his canoe. That's the oldest canoe? Uh, That's the oldest canoe. When uh, was it built? Late 18th, I think. They only use uh, stone axes and also uh, fire. Made the fire, then burned the old. Okay. So that means that you took good care of it because, yes. I mean, it's, uh, we treat the canoe as a human being too, especially. Because that is uh, the only way. For us to go as fast, Fatutaka, by canoe. So this canoe was made uh, from one single tree, right? Yes. This is over a century old, and it's still used for inter-island voyaging. Yeah. I've never come across any place where canoes are kept this long, or where people put this much effort into taking care of them. Uh, this is the only way for us to get fish from the sea. If a canoe is damaged to the point where it can't be repaired, they hold a funeral for the canoe, very much like the funeral that they would hold for a deceased relative. The amazing thing is that they use the island as an orientation point. They use the trees at the top of the mountain to find their approximate position out at sea. Then, one person jumps into the water to locate the reef exactly. Their fishing technique is very simple. They use fishing lines and hooks. And for bait, they mainly use pieces of octopus or squid. Simple, but so effective. We're now directly over the reef. We can see the bottom, and they really make it look easy. When you see the map they've drawn of the coral reef, you realize that this little island includes an area that's underwater. So for them, the island is not as small as it looks to us. It's surrounded by coral reefs that they know very well, and the size of the island extends to encompass all of that. 
Anutans have mentally charted all the coral reefs and fishing zones in order to manage them sustainably. This vital knowledge, passed down through the generations, is at the heart of their survival. For us, it's very important that we manage how we uh, catch fish. You see here, I think uh, sometimes we put boundaries, nobody can fish in it, and then it's about a year or one and a half, and then you can go back and harvest. They open it up and everybody can go. Fish is bigger and we have enough. It's amazing to see how fast we can move on the sail. It's impressive. Their isolation and enforced self-governance led naturally to sustainable development practices, essential to the survival of all the inhabitants of this ecosystem. It's our last day on Anuta. A certain sadness overtakes the crew. We've discovered far more than a fine example of balanced natural resource use. We will soon be taking leave of friends with whom we have shared openly, unreservedly. The Anutans insisted that the whole crew attend the farewell ceremony, a grand traditional banquet which will proclaim our status as new residents of the island. <laughs> I think everyone was impressed at how warm and welcoming they were. It's not always the case on ships, but we proved we're a good team. Interested, curious, we were willing to try anything they offered us. Eager, in fact. The farewell ceremony was pretty intense, I'd say powerful. Something we'll remember for the rest of our lives. We were a bit worried at first because we didn't know what to expect. But they are an incredibly welcoming people, very open, and it's clear they love their island. Dressed in traditional garb, we start the farewell ceremony by a ceremonial tour of the entire island for a detailed look at our new home, bequeathed to those who have understood and accepted the unique way of life on Anuta. The last day on Anuta was a real privilege. We were escorted by the whole village on a ceremonial walk around the island, as if the act of leaving footprints in the sand would give us a deeper insight into what the island was all about. They wanted us to soak it all in one last time. Our imprint will remain on the island and in the hearts of the islanders. Through their generosity, openness, and their traditions, they've taught us almost forgotten principles about the relationship of humans with the natural world. But above and beyond a harmonious relationship with the environment, we've seen and learned a great deal about basic human nature. <laughs> In some ways, they don't have a lot of choice. They can't snap their fingers and become people of New York or Chicago. That's not going to happen, and they know it. Um, on the other hand, they probably wouldn't really want to transform their island into a mini New York or a mini Chicago. They are making conscious choices. Their choices are not infinite. They know that they're constrained, but they also have um, made a decision that custom is important to them, and they want to try to hang on to it as much as they possibly can. We prepared gifts for the extended families, for the children, and for the little island school a length of fishing line, 
fish hooks, knives, everyday items that may seem ordinary to us, but that are far more valuable here. In keeping with tradition, we also visited each of the families and ate with them, very much in the spirit of Europa, where everyone is welcomed and treated as an equal. feast, everyone joined in the dance. It was a sort of mass revel in which joy and laughter are part of an emotional process that leads up to the lamentation. Traditional belief holds that gathering to weep for loved ones in this way lets people release the pain and sorrow of parting. There's always a feeling that this could be my last time. It's so hard to get to that you never know if you're going to be able to come back. And because of all of that, it's always an overwhelming emotional experience to arrive and then again to leave. came to learn about their way of living in harmony with nature. But we're leaving with far more, with a deep sense of principle and values, which we know not how or why, have renewed our faith in life. Mm -hmm.